I know I stand between you and uh, the recessional, and more importantly, the reception, where you're going to gather uh, one last time with your classmates, with your friends, your family, your loved ones, and you're going to savor this moment, as you should, of accomplishment uh, and revel in the fellowship you have with each other. So there's one last part of this graduation ceremony. I'm supposed to charge you as a class before you become alums of Stanford Law School. I'm going to refrain from commenting on the irony of a law school dean delivering a final charge uh, to law school graduates. In order to figure out what a charge was supposed to be, I, uh, I tried to find the origin of the whole idea. And as far as I can tell, or as far as I could say as far, what Google could tell me, there isn't one. But we're at Stanford. We could care less about the origins. We give it our own meaning. So my meaning is this. I think a charge should remind you of the great possibilities ahead for you, your capacity to take them on and thrive, but also to ask you to reflect a little critically on those possibilities. So here's what I ask of you. Remember two things. One is about the many opportunities and possibilities that your talent and training in law have created for you. And the other is a slight caution about the limits of that training. I think the possibilities of legal, legal training are extraordinary, and uh, it's a graduation, so I think I should start on a pretty lofty plane. Go big or go home, I think. So at the very loftiest level, law is a substitute for the use of force as a way of resolving disputes. A society that uses law or respects law uses it as a check on the force of the state and the power of individuals. If you're part of a military coup, Taking over a government, the first thing you want to do is dissolve the courts or other constraints on the actions of government. And if you live in a society without a functioning legal system, the physically powerful, the brutal, the fiendishly clever dominate others. So in a pretty fundamental sense, the existence of and the respect for law is fu foundational for a civilized society. It's a necessary condition, you might say. And at bottom, that's a commitment to rules and reason over force. You've probably been told a thousand times that law is a noble and learned profession, and I think that this is the core reason why people say that. Rules and reason are superior as a way of resolving disputes than might and force. That's the nobility part. Training in law is training in those rules and reason. That's the learned part. Obviously, having people trained in the law like you is only one of many factors that lead a society to observe and respect law, but it's actually a pretty important one. So I said I'd start high, uh, but I actually think the essential noble heart of law was fairly easy to forget when you learned about supplemental jurisdiction, Rule 23, the tax treatment of carried interest, my favorite, Section 706 of the APA, and any part of the UCC. <laughs> it's going to be a lot easier to forget when you're keeping track of billable hours, dealing with a crazy deadline imposed by a client, confronting a witness who's lying, or any of the numerous daily challenges of being a lawyer. I think it's worth reminding yourself of the lofty point, because the great possibilities that come with legal training are all connected in one way or another to it. And it also makes the difficulties of practicing law so worth bearing. So there are too many possibilities and opportunities to really count, but I thought I'd take a stab at just identifying a few of them. Many of you are going to start your careers in a form of conventional legal practice, a law firm, the government, nonprofits. I actually think uh, you should remember that that is part of something quite grand. You are connected to that lofty theme I just identified. We respect reason and rule over force, and you're part of that. I think it's a little more than that, though, for you as a lawyer and a human being. As a lawyer, you're going to owe a fundamental obligation to someone who is not you. You will be duty bound to represent your client, the interests of another. By itself, I think that's an honorable choice. It's one that allows you not only to fulfill your duties, but I think it makes you a better person. A great struggle in life is to view things from others' perspectives, to see beyond your view, your own view, your selfish interest. Owing a professional duty to another forces you to step outside yourself, to resist the natural but quite unattractive and dangerous human tendency towards self-involvement and selfishness. 
I think the nature of that duty, though, opens up more possibilities. That duty to your client doesn't require, in fact, it doesn't allow blind adherence to the client's wishes. Your duty is to advise and represent the client constrained by your best understanding of the law and your deep understanding of their particular situation. In effect, the law itself is a constraint built into the duty. Again, an everyday part of being a lawyer is connected to that lofty idea. We have a system based on rules rather than personal whimsy of the powerful. Part of the bargain is abiding by or coping with or changing the rules you don't like. One more thing to say about the opportunities that your training in law gives you. You came to Stanford wildly talented, and we like to think we've trained you uh, to understand the law. One part of that training, a very important part, is appreciating ambiguity in the law. Appreciating that nuance, nuance gives you two opportunities. It creates space for all kinds of lawyering, good, bad, and what you're going to do, great. It's in this space that your smarts, your knowledge, your skill is going to allow you to be creative. It's going to allow you to be ingenious. It's going to allow you maybe even to be brilliant. Your appreciation of the ambiguity, I think, also teaches you something else. It's given you appreciation of and I hope respect for the range of reasonable views that people hold on the correct answer to a question, the best course of action, and even the nature of the good life. You've been trained, that is, to have some critical distance, including from the position you yourself have settled on. That should breed respect, it should breed civility, it should make you a better decision maker. I think maybe most important, it might make you a wiser person. So what I'm, I'm trying to suggest is that whatever you do with your law degree, your training is giving you opportunities. It allows you to shine as a professional, it allows you to grow as a human being. But more than that, your training and ability as a lawyer, even if you're not practicing, makes you part of something pretty grand. You understand, you are equipped to pursue rule-based resolution of disputes as opposed to the alternative ways that involve force, brutality, or trickery. That makes you part of a system that's a necessary condition to the existence of a civil society. This might feel remote when you're putting together the deal documents or writing the brief, but I don't think it should. I think it's worth remembering. One way to remember this kind of grand connection between what you've been trained to do and societal flourishing is to remember that lawyer jokes flourish in a society like ours, where commitment to resolving disputes through rules is fairly robust. If you lived in a society where the other forms of power dictated the resolution of disputes, that joke about 10,000 lawyers at the bottom of the sea being a good start might not be so funny. Many members of the graduating class here are going to remember uh, the story that Sri Srinivasan told at the graduating class dinner. He told about his client, who was an immigrant, standing on the steps of the Supreme Court after what now Judge Srinivasan viewed to be a difficult, difficult argument. The client expressing great confidence that he was going to win because, as he said, that's how it works in America. Another way to remember this lofty and grand ideal of what a lawyer does is to think about when, what many of you and your classmates have done in law school and will do in their careers. Many of you are going to spend parts or all of your careers working to make sure that society's commitment to rule and reason is robust, even in the circumstances where it's most threatened, where the victims are least able to represent themselves, where exigencies of the moment overwhelm our longer-term commitments to our better selves, where a reviled or powerless minority is subject to the wrath of the majority. And some of you are going to use your law degree for changes in the law you believe are required by the demands of justice. I truly believe that every one of you is going to do important work in your careers. Those of you who are, have decided to use your talent and your training to very directly advance rule by law where it is most threatened is going to remind us all in a really salient way of that noble, noble heart of the law. And you will also be my personal hero, and I know that I'm not alone. I'm a legal educator. Of course, I believe that the opportunities presented to you in a life in the law are far greater than the risks. But I also ask that throughout your career, you take time to critically reflect on the risks of a life in the law. There are a lot of things to watch for. The critical distance that is an important part of being a good lawyer or thinking like a lawyer can make you too risk averse. If you're too risk averse, you won't take a leap and you know that you need to take a leap sometimes. The pressure to follow the wishes of your client, even when they go in the wrong direction, might force you to breach an obligation or mar your reputation. But the one I want to linger just for a moment on is that deep immersion in the law can honestly make you blind to other ways of thinking and other ways of being. 
I think this is the most professionally and personally dangerous, partly because it's quite subtle. This point was really crystallized for me in a reading group I had with students some years ago. In the group, we were discussing the book Remains of the Day by Isha Girl. I think the book is one of the most beautifully written books in the English language, and it's beautiful in a way that fine lawyers appreciate. It's elegant, it's spare, it's precise. There's not a wasted word. One of the students in the group was expressing great frustration with this book, and in explaining her frustration, she sort of ruffled through the pages impatiently and said, I mean, I, I just kept thinking while reading this book, what is the claim of this book? I thought, oh dear, how law school has ruined you. <laughs> she learned so well to think like a lawyer that there was nothing left of the rest of her. She couldn't appreciate the beauty of the language. She couldn't wonder in awe at the power of the author to evoke the characters, the place, and the time. If you know the book, you know that the great irony is of the story is the book actually has quite powerful claim. Uh, the claim is about the very real tragedy of allowing a professional identity to fully swallow the entire self, an enormous cost of losing human connection. So if I may, could you watch out for that? <laughs> Don't allow the way you have learned to think and analyze as much as it has become a part of you to squash everything else inside of you. Do not have critical distance when someone's asked you to spend the rest of their life with you. <laughs> Jump for joy when something wonderful happens. Cry when something awful happens. Wonder at beauty and art and music. And in your professional life, sometimes go with your gut. Don't ignore your heart when it tells you the rules, the system, or the, uh, or the rules, or the system is stupid or unfair. Sometimes say yes when the spreadsheet says no. I can't tell you when you should abandon that kind of thinking, except to say that sometimes your common sense, your sense of justice, or your instinct should trump. It's up to you to figure out when that is. Another way of saying it, I suppose, is you need to maintain some critical distance, personally and professionally, from your skill at being a lawyer. So just one last plea, and then we will recept together. You have truly amazed me and inspired me every day I've been here. You've done it with your energy, your decency towards others, your commitment to your community, your desire to do good, your spirit, your flat out amazing over the top talent. I wanted to know what you all thought of yourselves. So I spent some time in the last week asking some of the graduating students how they would characterize their time here. I know there was selection bias in the answers, but even so, they reminded me of why I've come to love and admire Stanford Law School in such a short time. So there were two words that every person I asked used about the their experience at Stanford. They were inspiring and community. That's a pretty great accomplishment that that's how so many of you feel about your time here. Here are some of the other words that were used. Innovative, open, intelligent, spirited, charitable, energetic, committed, fun, and naturally beautiful. I loved all these words and they resonated with me. As much as I loved the words that were used, uh, I was also struck by the ones that were not. There's no word here about pedigree. There's no word here about status. That's also pretty great. So here's what I think. I think the rest of the world could use a little Stanford Law School. When you head out, could you make a point of bringing a little of what we have here to your new place? Don't worry, you're not going to take it away from us. If we work hard enough, it's an inexhaustible good. Create a community that really feels like a community. Be part of a place that inspires its members. And strive for all of the other wonderful things we have here, wherever it is that you go. If you carry some of us elsewhere, you're going to make the world a better place. So this is truly the end of the graduation ceremony for the law school. Please join us in a reception on the other side of the building. Bravo and congratulations to the class of 2013.